Okay, next section deals with thrombosis, and the idea in thrombosis is that we get pathologic formation of an intravascular blood clot. Now again, recall that the idea in the coagulation cascade was that when we had endothelial cell disruption and we had disruption to the blood vessel, that we formed a thrombus, which was sort of like a band-aid, which then would seal off that disruption. Now in thrombosis, the problem is that instead of having a physiologic activation of the system, we have some disorder that re results in pathologic activation of the system so that we start forming intravascular blood clot or thrombus, but abnormally and at a time when we don't need it. And also within the blood vessel itself, which you don't want to normally seal off this blood vessel with a blood clot, obviously. Now, this can occur within an artery or a vein. Uh, the most common location is the deep vein of the leg, usually below the knee, and that's called a DVT. Uh, we're all familiar with DVTs. Now, it's important to note that when we have thrombus, it's characterized by lines of zon and attachment to the blood vessel wall. Why is this important? Let's say that I'm looking at a patient at autopsy, and I see that in their coronary artery, there is a blood clot. And now I'm trying to decide, did that blood clot potentially kill the patient? Because this is an autopsy, obviously. So I could ask the question, did this blood clot occur before the patient died, or did it occur after the patient died? Now, how would it occur after the patient died? Because once blood is no longer moving around in the blood vessels, all of the blood is going to clot within the blood vessels. And so that would be an example of a post-mortem clot. Obviously, if the blood's not being pumped because the heart's not functioning anymore, you're going to get clotting of the blood throughout the entire vascular system. So I can ask the question, did this blood clot occur before death or after death? And if it occurred before death, then it would be, I would have certain characteristics that I would be able to identify. For example, in a thrombus, which would occur before death, you would see lines of zon and you would see attachment to the vessel wall, whereas you would not see these in a postmortem clot. Now that requires us to explain a little bit what are lines of zon. So here's a picture of a thrombus that occurred obviously while the patient was alive and um, this particular thrombus has lines of zon and what we mean by that is here are red blood cells sort of this layer here and then you can see another layer of fibrin with platelets intermixed and then another layer of red blood cells and then another layer of platelet fibrins fibrin and then another layer of red blood cells another layer of platelet fibrin etc and so those are the lines of zon now there are three major risk factors for thrombosis and if we understand the risk factors we can then understand the disorders that are going to increase the risk for uh, thrombosis. The first of these risk factors is a disruption in blood flow, the second is endothelial cell damage, and the third is a hypercoagulable state. And so we're going to talk about each of these in much more detail. Recall that these three, um, they basically form the classically described Virchow's triad. But let's discuss each one individually in order to highlight um, how thrombosis might develop. So the first of the uh, risk factors for the development of thrombosis is disruption in normal blood flow. Now remember that when you look at a blood vessel, so that's the wall of the blood vessel lined by endothelium, correct? As blood flows through the blood vessel, it flows in a laminar pattern, in a layered pattern. Uh, and it's that layered pattern that helps to keep factors dispersed and inactivated. Now, if there's stasis so that the blood is no longer flowing, then that would increase the risk for development of thrombus. Or if there's turbulence so that the blood is no longer flowing in this laminar pattern, that would also increase the risk for thrombosis. Let's talk about some examples. For example, immobilization increases the risk for thrombosis, and we're well aware of the fact that there's an increased risk of DVT if the patient's not moving around. Um, that's because the blood, the, there's stasis of the blood, and when there's stasis of the blood, there can be activation of the coag cascade, which can then result in a thrombus. Another example would be cardiac wall dysfunction. For example, let's say that there's an arrhythmia, the patient has AFib, so that the atrium is no longer moving properly. If the atrium is not moving properly, then blood is not going to move properly, and blood is going to become, quote-unquote, slightly static, or it will not be moving in the, along as it should, and that will increase the risk of formation of thrombus as well. And we know that in patients with AFib, one of the complications is that they get thromb thrombus within their atrium. Um, another example would be myocardial infarction, where the patient gets an infarction so that they're not able to move the um, wall of the 
um, muscle very well, the cardiac muscle. So the cardiac wall is not moving well, which would then mean that blood could potentially remain static around that area, which would increase the risk of thrombosis as well. And the third example I've given you here would be aneurysm. Now, what's an aneurysm? An aneurysm is a balloon-like dilatation of a portion of the blood vessel. So pretend this is a blood vessel, and then here we come into a balloon-like dilatation of the blood vessel here. Now, normally the blood flow is laminar and, and continuous, but when the blood goes into this area of aneurysm, it can become slightly irregular in its flow. And when it becomes irregular in its flow, there's going to be an increased risk for formation of thrombus within the aneurysm. So that's an important general principle of pathology as well. The next of the risk factors is endothelial damage. And the reason why endothelial damage increases the risk for thrombosis is because the endothelium is highly protective against the formation of thrombus. The endothelium um, does many things to, to prohibit the activation of the coagulation cascade. And it's worth taking a little bit of time because each of these are high yield. And by the way, they're detailed in your book, so you don't need to write. You can, if you just pay attention and listen to what I'm saying, you can always go back and look at the details over there. So let's give some examples of what the endothelium does to protect against the formation of thrombosis. Now, the first way by which the endothelium protects against, the, against thrombosis is by simply forming a barrier that blocks away subendothelial collagen and the underlying tissue factor. Remember that subendothelial collagen, when it's exposed, will then allow the platelets to, um, to stick or adhese to the, um, to the area of disruption, and then that allows the platelets to aggregate, which then subsequently allows for the coagulation cascade to, to, um, to have a surface upon which it can be activated. So if you block the subendothelial collagen and the underlying tissue factor, that protects against thrombosis. So that's one way by which the endothelium protects against thrombosis. Another way is that the endothelium produces molecules like prostaglandin I2. Uh, prostaglandin I2, it blocks platelet aggregation. It's sort of the opposite of thromboxane A2. So the platelets produce thromboxane A2, but the endothelium produces prostaglandin I2, and these are sort of opposite of one another. Um, that's one way by which the endothelium can block platelet aggregation and hence block the activation of the coag cascade and thrombosis. Another way would be to produce nitric oxide. Nitric oxide causes vasodilation, which then protects against activation of the coagulation cascade as well. Um, another example is that the endothelium secretes uh, molecules that are called heparin-like molecules. So if this was the endothelium, for example, one of the molecules that's secreted are heparin-like molecules. Heparin-like molecules, they activate an enzyme called antithrombin-3. And guess what antithrombin-3 does? Antithrombin, so it inactivates thrombin. And remember that thrombin is the key molecule generated by the coag cascade that would then allow for cross-linking of the clot. So this, this particular molecule, antithrombin-3, is going to get rid of thrombin. And it's also going to get rid of the things that, that form thrombin. And what forms thrombin are all is the coagulation cascade. And so many of the coagulation factors will be disrupted by antithrombin-3. So again, the production of heparin-like molecules by the endothelium allows for activation of antithrombin-3, which then produces an, an anticoagulant effect or an antithrombotic effect. Another example of a molecule produced by the endothelium is TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. So the endothelium produces TPA. And it's important because remember that TPA converts plasminogen to plasmin. And remember that plasmin has three functions. Number one, plasmin cleaves fibrin, where, there, where a clot to be present, or it can also cleave, cleave serum fibrinogen to ensure that a clot won't form. So that's one way by which plasmin activates, uh, plasmin blocks the formation of thrombus. Another way by which plasmin does this is to destroy coagulation factors. Remember, that's the second mechanism of plasmin uh, function. And the third way is that, the, is that plasmin can block platelet aggregation. Now, all of these things, the cleaving of serum fibrinogen and cleaving of fibrin where a clot to be present, the destruction of coagulation factors and the blocking of platelet aggregation, all of these things are essential for protecting against the formation of clot. So, again, the endothelium is doing a very important job. And the final um, molecule that I want to discuss that's secreted by the endothelium is something called thrombomodulin. Now, what does thrombomodulin do? Thrombomodulin takes thrombin, 
and modulates its activity to do something else. Now remember, what does thrombin do? Thrombin is the product of the coagulation cascade that converts fibrinogen to fibrin, which then allows for cross-linking of the fibrin to produce the stable platelet fibrin thrombus. Now in this particular case, what happens is that thrombomodulin, what it does is it takes thrombin, and instead of allowing thrombin to convert fibrinogen to fibrin, it modulates the activity of thrombin, hence the term thrombomodulin, so that thrombin can actually activate protein C. Now what does protein C do? It then inactivates factors 5 and factor 8, which are important ampl amplifying factors within the coagulation cascade. So this is important as well, and that is that the endothelium produces uh, thrombomodulin, which is then going to redirect the function of thrombin. Anyway, all of these are protective effects of the endothelial cell, and if the endothelial cell is damaged, as I'm trying to highlight here, there's going to be an increased risk for thrombosis. So that's the second risk factor. And um, some examples of endothelial damage include atherosclerosis. Uh, when there is atherosclerosis, that results in endothelial damage, and recall that atherosclerosis is a major risk factor for the development of thrombosis. Uh, vasculitis, when patients get vasculitis, they get damage to the endothelium, and that can also increase the risk for thrombosis, and we'll hear more about that when we do the blood vessel lecture. And then finally, high levels of serum homocysteine can also cause endothelial damage. And this is a little high yield because it goes back to biochemistry and examiners like to go after it, so I just want to touch on this briefly. There's a couple ways by which we can get elevated levels of homocysteine. One way would be to develop a vitamin B12 or folate deficiency. Now the idea here is that when patients become vitamin B12 or folate deficient, they can no longer convert homocysteine to methionine. Recall from biochemistry that um, folate, when it comes into the body as tetrahydrofolate, so let's call that THF, tetrahydrofolate, it gets methylated. And in order for tetrahydrofolate to participate in DNA synthesis, it needs to lose that methyl group. So what it does is it gives that methyl group to vitamin B12. The vitamin B12, of course, accepts that methyl group, and so now tetrahydrofolate can participate in DNA synthesis. Vitamin B12 then quickly hands off that methyl group to a molecule called homocysteine. All right, and then homocysteine eventually will become methionine. And if imagine that if we don't have folate or if we don't have vitamin B12, we won't be able to obviously hand off that methyl group to homocysteine to produce methionine, so homocysteine will increase. And when homocysteine increases, that damages the endothelium, giving an increased risk for thrombosis. So one way by which patients can have an increased risk of thrombosis is to have a vitamin B12 or folate deficiency. Another way by which this could occur is that we could have a deficiency in an enzyme that's necessary to convert homocysteine to cystathionine. Uh, and that enzyme is called CBS, or cystathionine beta synthase. Now the idea here is that patients who have a genetic deficiency in this particular enzyme, they can't convert homocysteine to cystathionine. And if they can't convert it to cystathionine, then that's going to result in high homocysteine levels. And those high homocysteine levels will produce a disorder called homocystinuria. Now remember that in homocystinuria, go back to genetics, these patients have a few important features, like they get vessel thrombosis, but we understand why. The high serum homocysteine will actually then result in endothelial damage, which will then allow for thrombosis to occur. And in fact, I think about a fourth of these patients actually die at a young age due to thrombosis. Um, these patients also have mental retardation. They get dislocation of the lens, and they have these long, slender fingers as well. And so these are some of the features that we might see in uh, homocystinuria due to a CBS deficiency. Okay, and then the, th the third way by which we can get um, thrombosis, or I should say the third risk factor, is a hypercoagulable state. Now the idea here is that in a hypercoagulable state, the balance between procoagulants and anticoagulants that's normally present within the blood for the coagulation system to remain functional only when necessary, that balance is upset. So remember that we normally have procoagulant proteins that allow for coagulation, and we have anticoagulant coagulant proteins that stop the coagulation, and we need that balance. So if we have too many procoagulant proteins, that will result in a hypercoagulable state, giving us a risk for thrombosis. 
And if we lack the anticoagulant proteins, that would also give us an imbalance resulting in an increased risk for thrombosis. Now, of course, these disorders can be inherited or acquired, and we'll see that as we move forward. When patients have a hypercoagulable state, they tend to present with recurrent DVTs or DVTs at a young age. So again, usually this occurs in the deep veins of the legs. Other sites where they could have recurrent thrombosis would include the hepatic veins and the cerebral vein. So these are some other sites to be aware of. The first example of such a hypercoagulable state would be a lack of protein C or protein S. Now remember that protein C and protein S, what they do is they inactivate factors 5 and 8. That's the normal. So protein C and protein S normally inactivate factors 5 and 8, and factors 5 and 8 are amplifying factors in the coagulation cascade. So you do want to be able to inactivate them so you can shut down the cascade when you don't want to turn it, when you want it to be turned off. Now if you don't have protein C or protein S, you get less negative feedback on the coagulation cascade and the patients become hypercoagulable. And so protein C or protein S deficiency will increase the risk for a hypercoagulable state. Now an interesting thing that can occur in these patients uh, and something that's a feared complication is that there's an increased risk for warfarin or Coumadin skin necrosis. And this is a high yield uh, discussion so let's take a moment to actually remind ourselves of what's going on in, in this particular circumstance. Now remember that when we give patients um, Coumadin or warfarin, what we're really doing is blocking epoxide reductase within the liver. That then blocks the ability to activate uh, vitamin K. And if you can't activate vitamin K, then remember that factors 2, 7, 9, 10, protein C, and protein S will no longer be able to be uh, functioning properly or produced properly. Now you've got a patient that basically is sitting around with normal levels of all of these factors, right? And then what you do is you give them Coumadin or Warfarin and you start to decrease the production of new factors. So you're not going to be able to produce any more new 2, new 7, new 9, new 10, new, C, new C or new S. So what's then going to happen is that these factors are going to start degrading because they were, the old factors were present in the blood and so for a period of time the old factors will still be present. Now it so happens that the very first of these factors to actually degrade, the one that has the shortest half-life, are protein C and protein S. And so these will be the initial ones to degrade. And when these degrade, you're going to have these factors around without the anticoagulant factors. And so without those anticoagulant factors, there's going to be an increased risk for activation of these factors. So there's an increased risk for the formation of thrombus. And that's why when patients are put on Coumadin, we make sure that we also have heparin running at the same time because by ha having heparin running at the same time we protect them for that window and what is that window? The window, of per the window period until these factors will also be destroyed over time right? because they also have a half-life that will be relatively short and so over time these factors would also be destroyed and then we can remove the heparin. Now what happens in patients with protein CRS deficiency is that you've got this patient that's got all these normal factors around, right? And as these normal factors are present, then, what, then you give them Coumadin. Now if these patients were already deficient in CNS and you give them Coumadin, they're now really going to be very quickly deficient in CNS because if there's a little bit of CNS around, now that is also going to be gone with the short half-life. And so now there's a very increased risk of developing a hypercoagulable state. And so these patients have an increased risk, were they to get this hypercoagulable state, of getting thrombosis within the skin, which is called warfarin skin necrosis. So that's uh, protein C or protein S deficiency. The next disorder that we want to discuss is factor V Leiden. Um, and basically this is a very interesting disorder in which the patients have a mutated form of factor V. Now remember that factor V is able to be shut off by protein C and protein S. And the way that protein C and protein S shut off factor V is they go there and they cleave it. Now in factor V Leiden, the problem is that you've got a mutated factor V that can't be cleaved. It lacks the cleavage site for, by, for deactivation by protein C and protein S. So this then results in an inability to shut off factor V, and that inability to shut off factor V leads to excessive factor V activity, which then can lead to a hypercoagulable state. And this is the most common inherited cause of a hypercoagulable state. Another example that can result in a hypercoagulable state is prothrombin 2210A. 
Um, in this particular case, what happens is you've got a point mutation in the prothrombin gene that results in excess production of prothrombin. And guess what prothrombin is? It's prothrombin. It advances the effect of thrombin. And thrombin's goal is to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So this is going to promote thrombus formation, which again would increase the risk for a hypercoagulable state. Antithrombin-3 deficiency is a disorder in which the patients lack antithrombin-3. So remember that the endothelial cell is normally making heparin-like molecules. And those heparin-like molecules are binding antithrombin-3, and they activate antithrombin-3 so that antithrombin-3 can then inactivate thrombin and can also inactivate coagulation factors that could lead to the production of thrombin. And so if there's an antithrombin-3 deficiency, these heparin-like molecules aren't going to be able to activate antithrombin-3, and so that'll um, increase the risk for formation of thrombus. One of the very interesting things in patients with antithrombin-3 deficiency is that if you give them heparin at a standard dose, the PTT will not rise. First of all, remember that when you give heparin, you expect the PTT uh, to rise, and that's how you're going to monitor the heparin. By the way, the PT would also rise, but you use the PTT to monitor uh, the heparin. So that's, uh, that's the first point. Now, in this particular deficiency, when you give heparin, the PTT does not rise. And why does it not rise? Because remember that heparin works by activating antithrombin-3. That's the way that heparin works. You give heparin, and then it binds and activates antithrombin-3. So in this particular case, when you gave heparin, there would be no antithrombin-3, and so there would be no effect of the heparin, and so the PTT would not rise. Then what you do is you give the patient high doses of heparin. That activates the limited antithrombin-3 that's present, which then allows the patient to go into a, um, into a, to a certain degree of of an anticoagulated state. You then give Coumadin, um, which would then be given to maintain the anticoagulated state. And after you pass the window in which you would worry about Coumadin skin necrosis, you can, of course, stop the high-dose heparin. So, um, so this is a, another important example to be aware of. Finally, I'd like to say that oral contraceptives are associated with a hypercoagulable state. The reason why is that estrogen induces increased production of coagulation factors and that would then increase the risk for thrombosis as well. And that closes off our section on thrombosis, and we're now going to do the final section, which is embolism.